There's no place in Japan quite like it. It's not brimming with life as Tokyo or Osaka, but its calmness is exactly what sets it apart. Amidst towering cedars and whispering pines, rows upon rows of moss-covered gravestones, in a realm where spirits, nature, and man coexist. This is Koyasan. Despite being a UNESCO World Heritage Site and having the highest concentration of temples in Japan, Koyasan is not a super popular destination, which is exactly why I wanted to go. I mean, who wants to deal with hordes of tourists, right? But getting there was definitely an adventure. We are going from the Namba Station to um, Hashimoto. And from Hashimoto, we'll go to Gokura Kubashi Station. And there, we will transfer to the Gokura Kubashi Station cable car that will take us all the way to the bus station. And then we take the bus and uh, we are at our uh, temple station. So it's a bit of a journey, but it's totally worth it once you arrive there. Whether you're a history buff, a nature lover, or a spiritual seeker, Koyasan has a bit of everything to offer. Or should I say, a lot to offer. We got this um, Nankai two-day pass, which allows us to use any trains uh, on one day in one direction and in another day in any other direction. Uh, without these two days being consecutive. The most popular one is the heritage ticket, I think. And this one allows you to go to Koyasan and back and take advantage of unlimited buses for a smaller fee, but that's only for consecutive days. But let's get back to Koyasan. For over 1,200 years, Koyasan has flourished as an active Buddhist town. At the peak of its glory, it had more than 2,000 temples, but now the number is down to 117 bigger temples. When in 2004, Koyasan was recognized a UNESCO World Heritage Site, it put this location on the map for a lot of people. However, this number is nowhere near the visitors that Nara, Kyoto or Osaka receive. Staying in a Buddhist temple in Koyasan, known as a Shukubo, is one of the coolest things I have ever done. It was amazing to get a glimpse into the daily life of monks who live there. Plus, the room I stayed in was the most spacious one I had in Japan, and the view was absolutely incredible. I'm gonna close everything because this is damn cold. The room is a traditional one, so it gets pretty cold in the winter. That's why we have uh, two heaters. And then the table has this blanket and underneath it's uh, also heating. So uh, we are enjoying the tea and some snacks that we brought from home. Most rooms don't have a bathroom, but ours has. So haven't really seen this area. So this is the bathtub. Ooh, it's cold here. See a modern, amazing toilet. I love how you can come to like the most wild and sort of, you know, village places and they still have modern tech. That's pretty impressive. We will sleep on traditional Japanese tatami. These are the uh, mattresses that are rolled up and then uh, rolled back on the floor. Right from our apartment, we have this uh, Japanese garden. Well, I guess in Japan, all the gardens are Japanese. You can just walk around. I'm wearing my temple's clothes outside. It consists of a branded robe, then this uh, jacket with uh, very spacious sleeves, some pockets, and uh, the pants. I'm wondering if I can get some other shoes because this ones make it very difficult to walk. That's it for today, guys. Good night. As the sun slowly rises over the lush forest of Koyasan, the monks start chanting ancient mantras. Morning prayer is an essential part of their day, 
But for an outsider like me, it's a rare opportunity to discover a world shrouded in mystery. It's 7.20 and um, I've woken up for the morning ceremony uh, to see the monks praying. So uh, we'll go there in a bit. You can't record um, anything on camera, so maybe I'll just turn on the uh, audio recording if I can. Right after the meditation, it was breakfast time. The cuisine prepared by Buddhist monks is called Shojin Ryori or food of devotion and it's a fully vegan cuisine, so no meat, fish, milk, eggs or any products that come from animals. Additionally, onions and garlic are excluded as they are believed to agitate the mind and interfere with meditation. The meal is usually structured around the principle of one soup, three sides. So we had one miso soup, three veggie salads, a soy with edamame biscuit, some seaweed, rice, and pickles made from plum and ginger. The dishes were simple and made from local and seasonal ingredients. While shochin ryori didn't quite appeal to my personal taste, I respect that it aligns with the Buddhist principle of not taking any life. Okonoin Cemetery is unlike anything I've ever seen before. It's this massive, sprawling place with all these graves and stone lanterns and trees. It may seem strange, but I actually felt a sense of peace while walking through what is usually considered an eerie place. I couldn't help but wonder if this was a beautiful cemetery nestled in a forest, or rather a beautiful forest that houses a cemetery. One thing that I found truly fascinating is that despite its relatively short 2 km length, the cemetery is home to a staggering 200,000 tombstones. How is it possible to fit so many graves in one small place? Well, in Japan, it's customary to cremate the bodies and bury most of the ashes in a cemetery close to the family. However, the throat bone is separated and brought to a holy place. And for many, this place is Okunoin. The throat bone is the only thing that needs to be buried under the tombstones in the cemetery. The most common type of tombstone you'll see in the cemetery is the Gorinto, which translates to Tomb of the Five Elements. According to Shingon Buddhism, these five elements are earth, water, fire, wind, and space, and consciousness that is not represented in the grave, but makes up everything in the universe. So when someone passes away, they simply return to the universe. This is the biggest cemetery there is in Japan. It has over 200,000 tombs. It's one of the oldest cemeteries in Japan too. This is the resting place of one of the most revered religious figures in Japan, Kobodaishi, that's a Buddhist monk. And over the years, because of the reputation of this person, uh, a lot of uh, prominent monks, a lot of feudal lords wanted to get buried here to be closer to the sacred person. People come here either to visit their deceased or to pray to Kobodaishi because it is believed that he hasn't died really. He's just in a state of meditation awaiting the return of the Buddha of the future. And in the meantime, he helps people who plea for health, for help with any other issues. As you walk through the cemetery, you'll see countless statues dressed in red. 
they are round faced, plump, wear a bib and a bonnet, just like a baby. These are Jizo Buddha, the protector of children and pregnant women. People dress the statues in typical baby clothes to appease the Buddha so he can protect their children in the spirit world. Interestingly, anyone can be buried in Okunoin, from rich and influential people such as feudal lords, samurai, emperors, to common people with a connection to Koyasan or Shingon Buddhism. More recently, companies started to jump on this bandwagon too. There are over 250 corporate tombstones built by big companies or conglomerates to honor their deceased and loyal employees. The walk to Kobo Daishi's mausoleum is around two kilometers and that's the land of the cemetery, so it's really on the longer side. Uh, from this bridge onwards, there's no filming or taking photos. We'll just see what is inside. And uh, this was it for the cemetery. All this sightseeing has made me very hungry, so near the bus stop, I stumbled upon a charming little cafe. They had so many delicious options, but I got the egg sandwich and a cup of black tea. My husband got a beef cutlet with rice salad and miso soup. And this definitely was above my expectations. I sat there savoring each bite and enjoying the cozy ambience for only 20 bucks what a hidden gem you cannot underestimate japanese cafes even if they are in the countryside we came to daimon gate which is the main gate in Khorasan, and it marks the entrance to the city and we went all the way with the bus from okuno in cemetery like this like this like this here diamond gate is really beautiful but besides you know, looking at it, there's nothing more to do it. So I feel like you can skip it if you don't have um, enough time. It has got activity as an important entrance to Koyasan. Great inside. I'm basically done here and we'll go into town to see some other interesting stuff. Koyasan is believed to be a power spot, a place with great spiritual energy. This power stems from its long history as a spiritual center and the presence of numerous sacred sites. But don't get confused with all the temples and names and museums and whatnot. Know this, at the heart of it all is the Danjogaran complex. Several temples are located inside, but by far the most stunning is the 50 meter tall great stupa called Konpon Daito. You can enter the stupa for a small fee to see a three-dimensional mandala, which is simply put a map of the universe. Other than that, there is the Kondo Hall, this uh, large wooden temple where major ceremonies are held, but usually it's closed to visitors. Danjo Garan was a secret training spot in Shingon Buddhism, which is a sect that originated here in Koyasan. Shingon Buddhism views nature as a manifestation of the sacred, so it's no surprise that inside the sacred complex there is a beautiful garden and lake. Nature is often used as a metaphor and symbol in Shingon Buddhism to represent the qualities of enlightenment and the natural rhythms of existence. Another cool place to visit is the Kombuji Temple. This temple is the headquarters of Shingon Buddhism and features some exquisite rooms and beautifully decorated sliding doors. Behind the building is the largest rock garden in Japan, with rocks brought all the way from the Shikoku Island, the birthplace of Kobodaishi. So I'm just walking on the street nothing special and here's a toilet so this is a free toilet available on the street just look at how clean it is this is a toilet that is outside and let's just check the women's toilet okay automatic light they have toilet paper all is in order and you can see that the toilet paper has been folded so they 
regularly clean these places. In Khorasan, there's still snow. Uh, I saw some patches of snow, but here we have this big portion, a very slippery one at that, still covered in uh, uh, snow. Although I heard that this winter has been pretty mild by Japanese standards. Yay! We found a place. Uh, this place closes at 9 p.m. We are so lucky that we found it because we will have a proper dinner. There are two more guests besides us. Uh, but I have to say that I love the non-touristic season because there's just so much more space for you. So we are waiting for our food. The waitress told us it will take some time because um, they were not expecting guests basically. Unlike wine or beer, sake is served either hot or cold with the hot variety being very popular during the cold winter or spring months. A famous dish to be enjoyed with sake is yakitori. These are bite-sized pieces of chicken breast, thigh, skin, liver. You can see that Japanese are not shying away from entrails. They are dipped in salt or sauce and grilled on an open fire. As a main, I ordered kitsune udon, which is an iconic Japanese noodle soup with fried tofu and fish broth. To be honest, not a fan of udon here, so I should stop ordering this dish, hoping it will taste better uh, the next time around. So that's a wrap for my Koyasan adventure. Please subscribe if you found this format of cultural immersive travel video interesting. Also leave me a comment with the things that you enjoyed about the video and the things that you found boring. This is a great way for me to learn and uh, improve my future videos. Thank you so much for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Bye bye!